Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to give everyone a moment to um, get settled. Welcome. Uh, my name is Molly Gray. I'm very, very pleased to serve as your lieutenant governor and to host um, what I'm calling, what we continue to call a seat at the table. Uh, this is our last seat at the table event um, before the end of the legislative session, which we anticipate will happen this week. But it's been a real, real honor to bring Vermonters uh, into the State House virtually over the last several months to talk about a lot of important issues facing our state. I'm particularly excited about today's conversation, which is on um, caregiving during COVID-19 COVID and in particular paid family and medical leave and how do we ignite and build support for getting paid family and medical leave um, back into the conversation and to the state. But before I jump into sort of some framing of today's conversation and also introducing our incredible lineup of speakers uh, calling in, zooming in from across Vermont, I did just wanna mention a couple of um, housekeeping or introductory items. First, this is a recorded conversation. Uh, it will be available on YouTube later. I will share the link. Second, I invite everyone who's with us today to please feel welcome to put your name and affiliation, if you'd like, into the chat. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you'll be part of the conversation. We will uh, have a, a conversation with our panelists for the first 30, 35 minutes, and then we'd actually like to hear from those who are here today. F please feel welcome to um, share any thoughts or comments or questions in the chat. Also happy to recognize um, some individuals if you'd like to be recognized and say a few words. So today's conversation is about paid family and medical leave. And I think it's important to recognize that here in Vermont, there has been a really strong effort to make paid family and medical leave part of our statewide legislation. Uh, that's been an uphill battle, something that Morgan, who's here and will speak, knows quite a bit about. But importantly, um, as an aging state with a demographic crisis, this is something, a lack of paid family and medical leave in particular that touches all of our lives. We knew that before the pandemic, but we certainly know that now. And I just wanna share some of the, the national data that was put um, forward in the American Families Plan that the White House recently announced. The plan in particular acknowledges the pandemic has set back 30 years of progress for women in the workforce. It has meant about 64 billion in lost wages and economic activity. On average, a one in four women in the United States return to work within two weeks of giving birth and in one in five retirees depart the workforce earlier than anticipated to care for an ill family member. Um, there's also been a lot of data here in Vermont, some of it refuted around the number of women who have left the workforce over the last year uh, because of caregiving. But in many instances, we don't need the data because we have the anecdotes. We hear stories day in and day out about caregiving, about maternity leave, about individuals that need to leave the workforce for a time um, because of health issues. So. I'm excited today to introduce our incredible lineup of speakers. Each uh, panelist has a different story, has a different personal experience um, on caregiving, on paid family and medical leave. And today is really about amplifying their stories and giving them the space to help us grow support for this much, much needed comprehensive national strategy, but also a strategy here in Vermont. So without further ado, um, I will introduce our panelists and then come back to our first speaker. We have Liz Gamache, who served as the former uh, mayor of St. Albans, the city of St. Albans. Hallie uh, Picard, and Hallie, I'm sorry if I have that wrong, the last name, but you'll correct me, I hope, who's um, head of human resources at The Alchemist and is uh, zooming in from outside The Alchemist today in the sunshine. Uh, Jessica Arancibia, um, who's a licensed massage therapist and the owner and founder of Healing Arts Massage. Eric Sorkin, who's a co-founder and owner of Run Amuck Maple. And Morgan Nichols, who's the state director of Main Street Alliance Vermont. So welcome to all of our panelists. And Liz, we're going to come back and start with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have an incredible story over the, from over the last year on caregiving. And I just wanna thank you for being available to tell your story and to share some reflections um, on this really, really important topic. So thank you and welcome. 
Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, um, and I appreciate so much uh, having a seat at the table today uh, to talk about paid family leave and in particular, the um, importance of understanding and including uh, caretaking for our elders in these conversations. Like so many Vermonters, I wear many hats and today I'm wearing primarily my um, caretaker hat. During the course of the past eight years, along with other family members, we've been faced with an increasingly challenging and complex um, set of needs of our parents, my parents and my in-laws, as they entered into the final chapters of their lives. And like so many people, we have learned um, how unpredictable elder care can be, um, perhaps even more so um, in many instances than childcare, and that the needs are often intermittent, changing and increasing. And it makes it really complicated um, as caretakers to figure out how best to support our elders. I will tell you that um, I have been a mayor. I've worked for many years in the nonprofit sector. I've worked for regulated energy utilities. I've been involved in local and statewide government. So I consider myself pretty good at navigating um, systems, bureaucracy, finding solutions to difficult problems. Um, and I am pretty good in, at maintaining a positive and hopeful outlook. But I will tell you um, in the last years and especially this past year as a caretaker, um, I have found uh, navigating systems and supports for elder care to be the most challenging, time-consuming, frustrating, and confusing um, set of issues that um, I have ever had to face. So uh, first of all, I'd like to share a few thoughts on why I think it's so important for elder care to be uh, part of the paid family leave conversation. And I'll give you a couple of snippets uh, from a caretaker's perspective um, that I've gained over the last, uh, the last year, especially. Um, we're an aging society. Uh, I think if there's one thing we can all agree on uh, is that every single one of us is um, getting older. Not a single one of us is getting younger. We're not going in that direction. Um, yet at the same time, aging and death is something that we don't like to talk about. Um, so it doesn't get um, discussed as much as perhaps it should be. But here's what I see, is some things to think about. By 2030, residents over 65 years will comprise 20% of the US population. And of course, we know that Vermont is one of the states aging uh, most rapidly. Caring for elderly family members will increasingly fall to midlife adults who are also caring for children and sometimes grandchildren while often struggling to stay in the workforce. We talk a lot about the sandwich generation and I'm starting to talk increasingly about the club sandwich generation. Caretakers take on a variety of roles. Some of these include being a nurse, a laundress, um, taking care of toileting needs, being a chauffeur, an advocate, being a meal preparer, organizing appointments, being a legal representative, and so much more. The needs are complex and intensive. And to stay in the workforce, caretakers have to rearrange work schedules, cut back on hours and pay, take leaves of absence, and then other caretakers simply can't remain in the workforce and they leave altogether. Um, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned earlier, there are certain groups that are impacted more than others. Evidence shows that women and BIPOC caretakers are disproportionately impacted by this situation. And think about it, what happens when you begin to step out of the workplace and earn less? The lifetime impact on lost uh, wages Social security, pension benefits, all begins to add up. And then when you become an elder yourself, you're that much more behind the eight ball. So the systems that support our elders, they're complex, they're complicated, and they're often strained. They're challenged to navigate. Throw in a pandemic, boy, does it get even harder. Add an unexpected event like a cyber attack on the healthcare system, it gets worse. What about the shortage of nurses or lack of housing? and transportation options. To be clear, this doesn't mean that we don't have great organizations and people involved in elder care. Thank goodness we do. We need them desperately. But our systems can be difficult and time consuming to navigate. And the options and supports for our elders are often expensive, scarce, and very in quality. So I'm gonna shift for just a moment into um, an example of um, something that illustrates the complexity, something that we experienced in my family. 
Uh, before COVID, my mom um, was, uh, my parents were living independently and my mom had a health crisis. In February of 2020, she landed in the hospital and ultimately um, that led her to a rehab facility where she would spend hopefully just a couple of months to recover, to stabilize. She was a type one diabetic with dementia setting in and she was no longer able to care for herself. And my dad, whose vision um, had declined to the point that he is now blind, could no longer help to care for her. She needed 24 seven um, support to do finger sticks and uh, administer insulin. She needed access uh, to support on a 24 seven basis. So they made the tough decision and made arrangements to move into assisted living. And mind you, this was at the time COVID was starting to come across the country. So it was a desperate race to get them um, into a safe environment where she wouldn't be exposed to COVID. As it turned out, we weren't fast enough. Um, she didn't make it into assisted living um, in time. Uh, the facilities closed down to new residents. So there was only one option um, to bring her home. And at that time, there was also no access to um, home health care uh, nurses because they weren't coming into homes because of COVID. So our family made uh, the decision to provide that care for her. It was the only thing we could do. And the point that I want to make is that um, we had to make decisions on who was best able to move in to create that support. With most of our family members being essential workers in jobs that were non-flexible in terms of scheduling, it wasn't possible for them to become caretakers without taking a leave of absence or um, reducing their work hours. For me, I had a more flexible position and with the um, advent of remote um, conferencing, I was able to maintain full-time um, work while embedding myself for two months with my parents um, uh, to take care of my mom. Uh, we would not know that she would come home with COVID. So not only did we take care of her diabetes, we also um, helped her to recover uh, from, from COVID and uh, prevent my dad from catching it at the same time. The reason I say this is um, were it not for the flexibility of my job and were it not for the advent of remote conferencing, um, not a single one of us would have been able to provide the care without um, taking some steps to get out of the workforce. It just wouldn't have been possible. Um, so I guess what I'll say is that um, I'm going over my time, so I wanna um, come to a close. I hope this illustrates um, a bit of um, some of the challenges that we face. Uh, finding housing, healthcare is complex um, and urgent when you're in the situation, taking care of folks. Paid family leave will help caretakers, will help workers, will take uh, elder help elders, and it will also help employers um, all, all together to ensure that we're better prepared um, to help our elders and stay in the workforce. Uh, for those of you who are, who are policymakers, um, I hope that what you'll find is that by listening carefully to the many folks that are currently um, having experience with this caretaking, it will help to inform your decisions about how we can effectively include elder, um, elder care in the discussions about paid family leave. And I'm sorry if I went a little bit long, um, but I will stop. Wait. Liz, thank you so much. And please, no apologies. Um, thanks for sharing your personal story. And uh, it's really powerful. And also recognizing, I think, what you said about the sandwich generation, which I think um, so many people, as you know, myself included, and I think a lot of 30, 40, 50, you know, 60 somethings, right, are in a position where caring for kids and also caring for parents at the same time, which makes it really challenging. Um, I think so much of what you mentioned around uh, some of the recruitment and retention challenges we had, be it nurses or home caregivers or even uh, those working in assisted living facilities, we have a real, real challenge when it comes to making sure our parents and loved ones um, have a support network. But thank you. And um, we'll come back to you at the end because I'm going to ask you a little bit more about where do we go from here and uh, really appreciate all you've shared. I'm next mm -hmm. going to introduce Hallie. Uh, Hallie, again, works as the human resources, head of human resources at um, the Alchemist Brewery, the brewery we all know and love for Hetty Topper, among other things. But um, the Alchemist is also an incredible Vermont business that I know supports paid family and medical leave. So Hallie, th thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing for you, from you. Um, and I'm just delighted that you're here today. 
Thanks, Molly. Happy to be here. And thank you, Liz, for sharing your story. What a year it's been for your family. My goodness. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. I, I live in Morrisville with my husband and son, and I'm happy to speak to the other end of life, um, particularly maternity leave, um, as is more relevant for my time of life right now. Um, so I'll just share my story of the past few years and um, looking to the future. So when I was pregnant with my son Arlo, who's now three, I was not working for The Alchemist. I worked for another wonderful, small, growing Vermont company. Um, and I pieced together 12 weeks of leave, some paid, some unpaid. Um, we did not offer paid parental leave at that time, but had recently started offering some supplemental insurances, including short-term disability, which uh, maternity leave falls under. So I was able to take six weeks at 60% pay. Um, and it was something, and I know my employers were happy to be able to offer what they could at that time. So I used those six weeks at 60%. I used my two weeks of annual vacation time and I took four weeks unpaid to make up for my 12 weeks. Um, so then my husband who was working for the state at the time, who was a new employee to the state. So he hadn't accrued that wonderful time off that gets accrued when you work there for a long time. Um, he had no paid time really. So, and our son came early, so on a Monday morning. So he took five days of, un, you know, of sick time, I guess is how he categorized it. And then he was back to work. Um, we were fortunate, my family lives close by and we have a lot of support in the area. Um, so it was fine. And he ended up taking, um, after I went back to work, he ended up taking one day a week off over several months to be the equivalent of 12 weeks that you get unpaid for FMLA leave. Um, he accrued some paid time. So we made that work, which was um, helpful to save on one day of childcare also, um, and for him to have time with our son. So, you know, this worked, it was not ideal. Um, and it had to be pretty self-administered. I was the first in the company to go on maternity leave when we had these um, short-term benefits. So I, um, I was actually in the office with our office manager with my you know one week old baby in the baby carrier like sending faxes to the benefits company. Um, and I had the wherewithal to figure it all out. And I'm aware that that you know, takes a level of privilege and time and energy that not every new parent might have. Um, so we made it work and it was a, a financial stretch for our family, certainly. Um, I feel fortunate to not have to go through that again this time around. We're actually expecting our second child in November. Um, so I started working uh, for The Alchemist in December 2019. I had had several friends who had worked here and one of the main reasons that it was an interactive option was that it's close to home, but also that it, um, I knew the excellent benefits package that they offered, uh, especially for families. Um, we have three months of fully paid leave for birth parents, three weeks for the non-birth parent. We offer a pre-K childcare stipend, really flexible schedules and fully paid health insurance premiums. Um, this has proven with our staff of 42 people to keep young families at their jobs and in our state. Um, I think it's been six or maybe seven. We had a baby born last week of the 42 people on staff that have been born in the last 18 months since I've worked here. So there's a lot of babies and young kids um, on the crew and myself and one other colleague are both expecting later this year. Um, employee retention has remained incredibly high and this is obviously very beneficial for the bottom line of the company. We have an incredible crew um, and it's a family business and we, we care about each other. I know I'm very aware that most many small businesses cannot afford to offer these types of benefits. So that's where help from the state and federal government needs to come in to close that gap and make it more feasible. Um, so I feel really fortunate that I have this security and I, I also, you know, have a lot of friends and colleagues in various industries that don't have this. Um, and I, I wanted to add that prior to my last job, I worked for years in the restaurant industry as a server, bartender, manager, and it, it provides a great living and flexibility. And I love the work, honestly. Um, but it almost always lacks those traditional benefits that help provide the security for workers and their families. And I didn't have children at the time and I saw so many coworkers and I didn't maybe realize it at the time that would be coming back to work, you know, 
three weeks after having a baby, not three months, and you know, choosing or being forced to come back only part time. Um, and for a two parent household, restaurant work actually can work really well for families. You get to spend time if you're working, you know, in the night shift. Do you get to spend time with your kids during the day, save on childcare? You do the handoff at the shift change. And I watched it, it really, it does work. Unfortunately, um, as we all know, many restaurants operate on the slimmest of margins. And so offering any kind of robust benefits package is out of the question. So we've seen it, myself included, many folks leaving the industry in favor of a more traditional job, often with a lower take home wage, um, to be able to provide those benefits and a more consistent schedule for their families. And I've just, this past year has made me be thinking a lot about my restaurant industry folks, both folks that own places or work there and how fragile it is and how we need to re-examine the industry and work to professionalize it in ways that support those workers um, and our economy, especially in tourist towns like Stowe that depend on this labor force. Um, and I think there's still thousands of vacancies across the state in the hospitality industry. And I'm, I'm really nervous for them for this, the busy coming um, summer months and just thinking about how we can support that labor force that's so important to our economy. So those are those are my thoughts on on in my story. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry if I went over time. <laughs> no, no, it's good. We're, we're creating lots of space here today and a huge congratulations to you. It's really, really exciting. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate, I just want to acknowledge a couple of the things that you mentioned, which I think are important takeaways. Um, advocacy and being able to advocate for yourself, which is really hard um, when there isn't a structure set up. And I think Liz mentioned this too, right? To support families that are in different caregiving positions or preparing to have a baby, right? And, and knowing where to start in, um, in that process. Um, also, I, I love what you said about uh, providing paid family and medical leave being something that's proven to support families and staying in Vermont, working in Vermont, especially young families. And we know that we need young people to stay in Vermont. Um, so I'll, I'll certainly come back to you as well. I think there are a lot of questions around like, where do we go from here and what can we do? But one thing that you did mention that I also think is important to acknowledge is just how much the service industry has been impacted in the state. And we've heard this again and again from restaurant owners, restaurant workers. Um, the data suggests that, as I said earlier, there's been a higher level of women leaving the workforce, especially in those industries, and also um, BIPOC Vermonters um, who are often working in service industries. So I think um, there are a lot of different pieces of this important puzzle that we've got to put together and figure out. I'm really excited, though, to introduce um, another woman who has been um, working at the forefront of the pandemic in the service industry, and that is Jessica um, Arancivia. Jessica, I'm going to have you correct me on your last name if I didn't get that <laughs> correct, but Jessica is the founder and owner of um, Healing, let's make sure I have it right, the owner of Healing Arts Massage, um, and I believe lives in South Burlington area. So Jessica, wonderful to, to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today, and thanks for being willing to share um, your story, which I think is a really important one in this discussion. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Gray. Um, yeah, actually, coming right after Haley, this is the perfect segue into my story um, because I was at the forefront of being a service worker early last year, um, working in resort life and um, wondering what my next step was going to be, basically, um, right before the pandemic started. So. Hello, I am Jessica Aaron Sebia. I am a licensed massage therapist and owner of Healing Arts Massage in South Burlington. Um, this past year, like for so many, has been one of adapting and surviving. Um, early last year, I decided to pursue my business full time uh, in order to give myself that flexibility and stable work environment to start a family. And after working about eight years in the service industry as a massage therapist, the biggest takeaway that I had was that I was disposable to my employers. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it is very true for a lot of service workers. Um, wasn't really the greatest thing to bring into the plan to start a family. Uh, thankfully, at the time, my husband's employer had really good insurance and benefits, and I was able to stick to our plan. Further, It further supported my efforts to start my business. And uh, for three months, I basically worked on my business plan. And on March 6th of 2020, I resigned from my former position 
and the world shut down due to COVID-19. So because I had resigned from my job, I wasn't eligible for unemployment benefits. Um, and I had to wait almost three months before I was approved for $191 a week in PUA. Uh, it was incredibly stressful. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a little bit emotional here. Um, it was incredibly stressful for us. Uh, and it was made even worse when my husband got the news that he was no longer furloughed, but he was let go completely. So there we were, <laughs> let me get my composure a little bit. There we were not working, no health insurance, no paycheck coming in, no clue when the world was gonna go back to normal. Um, but fortunately, uh, I was able to use my stimulus check right on time um, to start my business in early June. And with the awesome support of some close personal friends, I was able to find a location and begin building my clientele. Um, and I'm proud to say that I, I did survive most of the last year through just sheer determination and grit. Um, no matter what, I was sticking to this plan and I was gonna make it work. Um, as best as I could. And uh, I'm super grateful to say that I've endured and I've thrived in the past year. Um, people now more than ever need massage therapy. They need touch, they need nurturing. Um, that's the one thing that I think was the most fulfilling for me over the past year. Um, and on top of that, my husband through this journey has also uh, pursued his dream of becoming an entrepreneur and starting his own restaurant. Um, but amidst all of this success, there is still one part of this story that still has no solution and it's our plan to start a family. Um, so yeah, how are we going to afford to have a baby? How do we provide for my 16 year old stepson, run two businesses and also stay home after the birth of our child? Um, once we have a child, how much will it cost to find childcare? Uh, and how many days will I be able to work, pay the bills and still spend time with my newborn? Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on something that's very important to me also, but, you know, historically in this country, women have been marginalized when it comes to starting a family, uh, especially women of color who happen to be more in the service industry, such as providing childcare for other families. Um, and they're now moving into these greater numbers of becoming sole proprietors for this reason. Uh, so most of the time, these workplaces that they're traditionally in do not provide any benefits and won't allow the women to stay home, let alone their partner to stay home with them. Uh, so these risks for women and families as a whole to have the courage to choose a better life and a better career path to make life better for them, it often presents with a lot of sacrifice. Um, I actually have a colleague who's in the next room uh, who has taken the last few years to save almost $10,000 in an effort to provide herself with some kind of child leave. Um, but yeah, that's amazing and that's awesome. What happens when life throws us curveballs? What happens when a pandemic affects the entire world? Um, there's no safety net, there's no job security, there's no infrastructure in place to protect us. I've had multiple prenatal clients on the table this past year that have expressed that they're not sure they can stay home past the four weeks that their employer has given them. What about sole proprietors like myself and my husband who now have no options for paid leave. So to finish out, you know, no parent should have to choose between bonding with their newborn and getting a paycheck. And I'm happy to be able to be here and lift my voice on this issue. And I hope that we can finally get this across the finish line for all workers and families. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was really powerful, Jess. And um, it's hard to even know what to say. I just want to sort of let what you shared <laughs> sit here with all of us. Um, but I just also just want to recognize your determination and grit and my goodness, what a time to start a business um, and your endurance, but it's true. I think no woman or family um, in Vermont should have to choose between bonding with a newborn or thinking about starting a family and paying the bills and your own economic well-being. Um, so Thank you for sharing that. I think it's also a really good segue into a story. Um, I'm really excited to now introduce Eric Sorkin from Run Amok Maple, a pretty incredible Vermont company. We probably all know the amazing maple syrup that um, Eric and his wife and family and incredible employees make. Um, I know it's been a tough maple season and really glad Eric's here to talk about what 
some businesses are doing, like the Alchemist, like Run Amok Make Bowl, uh, to offer paid family medical leave and why this actually makes sense, um, why it is possible. So Eric, thanks so much for joining. I'm really delighted to, to have you here today. And uh, I, I know the season's done, but it's, I'm sure it's still a busy time. So thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I, I appreciate being invited here today. Uh, Jessica, that's, that's a tough one to follow. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and um, Lieutenant Governor for your, your support of workers and small business owners. With that in mind, um, I wanted to share some of my business's experience with the need for paid family medical leave. Um, my wife and I are the owners of Runwick Maple. We employ about 75 people. Uh, most of them at our manufacturing plant in Fairfax and the rest work at our maple sugaring business. Um, as business owners, we do everything we can to support our employees. Um, I know it sounds trite, but it, it is true. Our business is no more and it's no less than the team that we build. You know, we, we, we work hard at Runabuck to make it a good place to work. Um, you know, we're not perfect, but we definitely know what we're striving for. We want to provide the best place for our employees and we hope that they'll want to do the same for us. Speaking for myself, um, the importance of paid family medical leave has been crystal clear to me pretty much since we started. Uh, this was before we had a manufacturing business and we were, you know, we were just a purely agricultural company. <clears throat> we had about 10 employees at the time. And um, I learned that one of them had a wife with terminal cancer who was close to her death. Um, it was right in the middle of sugaring season and you know, the, the hours are long, they're unpredictable. And he was coming into work because he wasn't in a position to miss a paycheck and he was concerned about potentially losing his job. Um, to put it succinctly, he believed he couldn't afford to spend time with her, even though he desperately needed to. Um, well, that, that's really stuck with me. Uh, you know, in, in that instance, it wasn't a remotely hard decision. You know, we covered his needs, but if I'm being honest, um, his gratitude for the paid leave, it, it made me very uncomfortable. Um, as a small business owner, I'm, I'm often surprised by some of the responsibilities I've assumed. And this was one of those times. I wasn't prepared for the fact that I would need to choose between my business's profitability, which for us is synonymous with my own paycheck and my employees' health and well-being. I mean, the choice was essentially what could I afford to do? Or, um, you know, maybe it was really, what was I willing to do? Um, that's a position that we as a society should do our best to prevent. Nobody, least of all those in the most precarious financial positions should have to choose between getting paid or taking care of loved ones or their own health. And likewise, you know, why would we embrace a system where small business owners must choose between their own pay and the well-being of their employees. That's a recipe for poor choices and bad outcomes on both sides. Well, that was about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and since then, I can't count the number of times our employees have had similar needs. Members of our team have been out for extended illnesses to care for loved ones and for maternity leave. Um, just in the last few months, one of our longtime employees contracted viral meningitis you know, he, he was out for weeks as he battled a persistent fever and delirium. Um, needless to say, he was very concerned about his own health. Um, another employee uh, was sexually assaulted over the winter and she struggled with her mental health since then. She's needed flexibility and time off to heal and it's been a rough road to her recovery and she can't possibly know when she'll get there. You know, the last thing either of them needs is the added worry over getting paid. Neither of them did anything wrong. And I think we can all agree that these things happen and that none of us can predict when. Not all of us have the financial resources to navigate such situations successfully. Um, you know, on a sunnier note, we also have one employee out maternity leave and we have two more that are pregnant. And these are indeed happy events, but they come with financial concerns. You know, and what does it say about us if we don't take care of those in need? You know, but I guess what I want to say is the case for national paid family medical leave coverage, it doesn't rest on compassion alone. 
it's also very good for small businesses like mine. While I personally believe that the return is many times the expense, paying for family and medical leave is costly. The financial burden on our businesses has been significant, particularly during the early years before we were profitable. Um, you know, I would love it if there was a comprehensive national program that addressed this need. Without it, asking small businesses to cover these expenses out of pocket is really asking for quite a lot. And the alternative, asking for workers to go without coverage is at least as bad. You know, Vermont is a state made up of small businesses and those who work for them. By creating a national paid leave solution, we would create a more level playing field for workers and all of our small business owners. And uh, that pretty much sums up my thoughts. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Wow, I mean, um, thanks for just speaking so candidly and frankly. And it's crazy when you said, you know, that was 10 years ago. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize this isn't a new conversation, right? This isn't the first time we're talking about paid family leave. It's 2021. The rest of the world has had paid family leave or many, many, many countries um, for a very long time, yet we still don't have it here in the United States. And I think it's, it's really important to highlight what you said about employers being put in a really tough position, right? We don't want to put employers in the position of having to choose between the well-being of a company and the well-being of employees. That is a recipe for disaster um, as well. And that uh, I noted down, you said business is no more or less than the team we build. And I think that's so true about our Vermont businesses and your business, of course, um, the Alchemist, but so many other businesses around the state who have said, we're going to do this with or without a state or national strategy that have been leading the way and making it more normalized, but it's still not on your back to make it possible for all Vermonters. So thank you for sharing that. And thanks for all the compassion you bring to everything you do. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to introduce Morgan Nichols, who's the state director of Main Street Alliance Vermont, is no stranger to the paid family and medical leave debate, has been working inside the state house, I think this year, the virtual state house. Um, but I just want to thank Morgan, one, for helping us uh, bring this uh, seat at the table to, to fruition. I think it's an incredibly important topic. I have my own paid family and medical leave story as well um, and care about this topic deeply. But uh, Morgan, over to you. I think you know, the big question is sort of where do we go from here and um, what's possible for Vermont? Um, help paint the picture for us and please share anything else you wanna share about you know, what do you think comes next? Morgan, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, for the opportunity to be here uh, today and to all the speakers um, for lifting up your voices and sharing your story. I have some prepared remarks, so uh, but then at the end, what we'll do is we'll share some action action items for the for the call um, and ways that you can get involved. Um, so I just want to start out by saying, um, and MSA Vermont, our members know how critical our care um, infrastructure is to our workers and our family. Um, and, as, and as we're in the final week of the legislative session, I just want to thank the legislature on behalf of our membership um, for all that they have done to move thoughtful um, and equitable policy that serves our children and our families, particularly um, H-171, a child care bill that gets us closer to the goal of ensuring that all families have access to high quality and affordable child care in the near future. Um, Additionally, I want to thank our federal delegation um, for all that you have done for Vermonters throughout this last year and for showing your continued support for paid family and medical leave um, by all signing on to the Family Act. Um, we look forward to the continued work ahead um, to support you um, in your work throughout the summer and fall to help make paid leave a reality for all. So I'm also kind of wearing two hats on this call, uh, uh, Mer former Mayor Gamash. I, I, I understand that the hats that we all wear here in Vermont um, uh, and speak fondly about uh, just the, the hustle in Vermont that we all do to make it work to live here in the city or in the state, I'm sorry. Um, so first, um, as an advocate um, who's working to lift up Vermont's voices on this issue, and second, as an individual who has recently benefited um, for our, from my employer's paid family and medical leave um, policy. So I'll start there um, as a worker. Um, it was April of 2020, um, a month into the pandemic, um, and I felt a lump on my neck. Uh, five months later, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer um, and had to have surgery to remove my thyroid um, and about 42 lymph nodes in my neck. 
while I'm so grateful that this is a highly treatable cancer um, and I'm on the road to recovery, it was an incredibly stressful time, continues to be so. Um, but after surgery, it took a long time before I was able to lift anything heavy and get um, full use out of my left arm and shoulder due to nerve damage. Um, and it wasn't lost on me that had this happened just five years ago, um, when I was working as a line cook as, and a server in a restaurant, I would have been out of work for at least three months um, because of just the fierce uh, physicality of that position. And I can't even begin to fathom the consequences that, um, that those three months of unpaid leave would have had on me financially. Uh, and if I learned anything from that experience, it is that no one chooses when they get sick or injured. Um, we need to ensure that all workers in every job um, have the ability to put their health and safety first. So I'll take off that hat um, and put on my other hat as the state director of Main Street Alliance of Vermont. And for those of you who are, who are not aware, um, we're an advocacy organization that supports Vermont small businesses as they lift up, lift up their voices to support policies that support our workers, our families, and our communities. Because we know that when we have healthy communities, our small businesses can thrive. Um, and MSA Vermont um, is one of the co-leads of the Vermont Family Coalition, along with Voices for Vermont's Children and the Vermont Commission on Women. We are a coalition of 26 Vermont organizations that represent thousands of Vermont's workers, parents, caregivers, small business owners, and advocates for gender and reproductive equity, family, food security, racial justice, disability rights, and more. And we are working together to lift up the voice of our constituency and all Vermonters in support of this critical policy. We know that all workers have at one point in their life the need to take time off to welcome a new child, care for a loved one, um, or care for themselves. And we know that nationally, four to five private sector workers don't have paid family and medical leave, with women being more heavily impacted as they make up the majority of our service sector jobs here in Vermont and are um, more often called out of the workforce to care for children and loved ones. This was clearly evident throughout the pandemic with women and women of color experience, experiencing outsized impacts um, due to the lack of a strong care infrastructure. Um, the economic burden of, a having, of not having an equitable, inclusive, and universal paid family and medical leave solution puts workers and families in absolutely crushing positions where they have to be choose between their health and safety and paying their bills. Um, and this can have catastrophic consequences for their housing, food, and overall financial security. So as I'm sure as you can all imagine, um, we were thrilled to see that the Biden administration administration included paid family and medical leave um, into their American Families Plan. And we also know that there's a lot of work to get this across the finish line <clears throat> over, the next, uh, over the next few months. So uh, with that in mind, I have two asks. Um, first, if you would like to show your support for the passage of a national paid family and medical leave solution, I'm going to put something in the chat, we would love for you to sign on to our call to Congress chat. Just want to make sure I get this right. Um, and what this will do, this will help you to join our mailing list. So as um, opportunities come up over the summer um, for you to lift up your voice. Um, and so we can also show that there's just a resounding for support from this um, from Vermonters. Um, please sign on to that. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can sign on as an individual, um, as a business owner, or, or as an organization nonprofit. Um, so that is our first ask so that we can just join that, that group. And then the second one is that you consider sharing your stories with others. As you have obviously heard in today's call, um, stories are the most impactful way for, uh, to bring more people to this cause. And we were working on developing a social media campaign throughout the summer to add Vermont's voice to this national fight. So if you're interested in sharing your paid leave story, um, I ask that you please fill out, and again, I'll put it in the chat. I apologize for this, I should have that prepared. Um, uh, please share your story in that Google form. Um, and again, yeah, thank you all so much for being here today for the opportunity to be here, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, and that's all That's all I have for today. Oh, I apologize. I do have, if you would like to email me, if you have any other questions on paid leave, I've put my email in the chat. Thank you. making sure I was unmuted there. I was just talking away. Um, I, I think, uh, thanks for all you do, number one. Um, number two, this is such an important moment, as you said, to share stories, right? These are, these stories, we all have a paid family and medical leave story. And um, each of us 
is impacted in some way when it comes to caregiving, right? Be it deciding to move back to Vermont because you want to take care of family members and have kids and then going through that struggle of trying to figure out how are you going to pay for it, right? How are we going to do it all? Um, you said no one chooses when they get sick. And that's absolutely true, right? Do we see that over the last year? Absolutely, day in and day out. So we want to share these stories. We want to uplift your stories. We want to build as much momentum as we can here in Vermont. I think we're pretty lucky in having a congressional delegation that is on board when it comes to paid family and medical leave. But we still need to be able to have an infrastructure in place here, which may require legislation so that um, when or, or if, but hopefully it's a when the American families plan passes that we're also um, ready to go here in Vermont. Um, I do want to leave some time, we don't have a ton of time, but for any questions or comments from attendees here today, we do try to keep a big open table. It's really important to me to be able to do that. I did want to recognize Matthew uh, Lafleur, who's from Green Mountain Self Advocates, also a Special Olympics Vermont athlete. He's been with us at every seat at the table. Um, Matthew, we would love to have you say a few words if you want to um, join us. There you go. Hey, Matthew. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I agree with on the panel of the speakers. You know. Uh, Yes, my name is Matt Lafleur. I'm Green Mountain Self Advocates, Special Olympics Vermont, uh, now affiliation, new affiliation of LDA of Vermont, Learning Disability Society Association of Vermont, from an, a national organization from Pennsylvania. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with what all the speakers have said. It's, it's, it's a big issue, like A, how to identify those problems in the Vermont statewide system. We have already identified it. B, which is number two is how can we uh, fix the system we have in Vermont, not just in Vermont, but statewide, not only statewide as individuals, but as a country, as a United States citizens, how can we move forward together on these issues, not only by advocating, but how to, fit, how to you know, work on the problems here at home so we can bring it to the national scale so we can work on it as together as a nation. And number three, it's uh, for me as an individual, not only with disabilities, this is for the whole spectrum as a whole, not in just uh, Vermont, it's United States of America as a whole. I look at it as, you know, it's a bigger problem. These systems hasn't been updated for a long time. And when one community is affected, then we all are effective in one way or another. We can't dismiss it, it's there. We gotta find a way to, you know, come around those issues, come together on those issues, come move forward on those issues that, you know what, that will make this system more efficiency and more cost-effective ways so we can, uh, you know, lift up other people's voices up. Hey, I'm also a person of color, but you know, for me to, you know, disclose all that information out there, I'm not afraid. Why am I and I'm not afraid? People ask. I'm not afraid because my rights are my own. Your rights are your own. And for me, it's you know, just to you know move forward on these issues. I'm willing to do that because for me, it's you know, it's big, it's a bigger, broader importance, not just state, not just for my state as a whole, as a United States citizen as a whole. Because for me, as a person with disabilities, and I'm willing to say that, I'm not afraid, I'm not ashamed, I will say that. Because you know what, the more people hear you, the more you speak up, the more you, you know, voice your opinions, the more you, you get that feeling, that emotions, and let those emotions, you know, rise up and just say it. Just say it because they're hearing you. Everybody's hearing you. They want your stories. They want to know what makes you you. And for me, what makes me me is to bring other people's story together around issues, not just Vermont issues, but United States America issues, because we are Americans. We deserve paid family leave. And for me, it's a very, uh, we are, at, are actually in a perfect timing to move these issues forward with a president that sees it, knows about it, 
and wants to address it so we could actually put the United States of America on a map so everybody has the right for paid and family medical leave. Thank you, Lieutenant Molly Gray, for inviting me. Thank you, Matthew. Man, I'm just going to give you a round of applause, and um, I hope everyone else will join me. Thank you so much for your advocacy. Thanks for speaking the truth. Thanks for bringing so much passion to this issue, um, into your work as well. And I, I just wanted to pull something you sort of referenced at the beginning about Vermont being um, a laboratory. And we can start things here in our communities and our amazing businesses um, here in our state and they can move nationally. And we've seen that, right? We've seen that happen a lot of ways, but this is also part of a, a larger conversation that doesn't just impact um, Burlington or Fairfax or South Burlington or Waterbury. I'm trying to remember where everyone is right now, um, St. Albans, this impacts communities around this country and also around the world. And we have the data. Um, so this is a hopeful moment. This is really exciting. We do have about seven or eight minutes left. I do wanna encourage everyone who's here, um, please, sign or uh, add your information to the campaigns that Morgan Nichols share, the Excel sheets. Um, please share your stories. There's gonna be so much work to do in the days, weeks and months to come to make this happen in Vermont and nationally. Um, I'd like to close actually with giving our speakers the opportunity just to make some concluding remarks, um, a minute or two at, at the most. But I think you know one thing I would pose to you is sort of, um, what do you see as the most urgent action now, if you want to share that or anything you'd like to share, just knowing um, where we're going. And I just want to thank all of our speakers again for your time. And thank you, Matthew, as well. So with that, Liz, I'm going to go back to you and then we'll just go right through the panel um, again and give Morgan the last word. Liz, thanks so much for joining us. Great, thanks. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll say I appreciate the opportunity for some action items. Uh, so I will be happy to hop online um, and uh, fill out the forms uh, that Morgan has provided to us. My concluding um, thought is, is this, um, that um, when it comes to paid family leave, when it comes to so many of the issues that we're faced with, taking a multi-generational approach is really important. Um, I think that a paid family leave can be part of um, a multi-generational aging plan We've seen some other states um, successfully. California recently launched their multi-generational aging plan. And um, I, I would look forward to uh, continued conversations about paid family leave and how that could potentially fit into a plan for multi-generational aging in Vermont. Thank you, Liz. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Hallie, over to you. Yeah, I, I will echo that and, and what so many of us have already said. Um, I think just sharing these stories, I mean, just listening to each of you speak, I was emotional at each of your stories and choked up listening to you. And if more people can hear these stories and just connect on a human level, it's about human dignity, right? Um, and just also, if this last year has taught us nothing that this the service industry our blue collar our hospitality workers are holding up our economy and if we are not supporting them then what are we doing you know and i think as eric or, or more than one of you said if we don't have our people then and our teams then we don't have businesses so it, it seems so simple but obviously it's a very complex issue and and Thank you for providing those action items. I will spread the word, Morgan, and thank you for having us here today. Thank you. Uh, amen to all of that it is. It's about human dignity. Absolutely. Um, Jessica, are you, where are you? I'm still here. <laughs> there you are. Good. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. And um, I know you're right in the middle of the work day, so I really appreciate it. And it's yeah. my day off, so no worries. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, exactly what we've all said. And, and actually to touch on what Liz said as well, um, although my topic today wasn't about uh, paid medical leave and dealing with elder care, um, I have experience in my family. Um, in my 20s, I was elder caring for my grandmother um, who had ALS and my father now does it. So I think the focus on having a conversation be like, it's not just one generation, it affects all generations because families come in all shapes and sizes in this country. And you know you have single parents and you have elder parents and young parents. It's 
it's a whole nationwide conversation about how we are all the same and we all have the same hurdles and obstacles to overcome and we do not come in this black and white cookie cutter box. Um, so to deal with family paid leave and also medical leave, there are many of us who are gonna need both probably around the same time in our life um, or one right after the other. So if we can just continue on this path of seeing everybody as equal um, and that we're all going through the same struggles together and providing some really great infrastructure so that we can all really succeed and thrive in our communities and our businesses and at home. Um, that's the, the most important thing is just providing some kind of infrastructure. Right. And the, uh, the key word I think is the one you just used, infrastructure, right? And actually, uh, Matthew talked about this a little bit. We often think about paid family leave as just sort of like nice to have thing that's over here instead of it being so critical in the same way that childcare is and same way that broadband is, right? It's all infrastructure to our economic well-being, to businesses being able to thrive, to families being able to thrive, um, to deep equity, right? Um, and I think what you you really pointed out well is the fact that you may need paid, you may need maternity leave while you need medical leave, um, while you need leave for elder care. Um, and it may all hit at the same time and being able to have that infrastructure in place. So thank you. Um, Eric, over to you. Any um, ask or final words? Sure. Th thank you again for putting this together. It's really, it's very inspiring hearing everyone's stories. Um, it's been really, really, really nice. Um, I guess where I leave it is I know there are a lot of moving pieces and many competing priorities with Biden's plan, but um, I think it's important that we keep raising our voices because we just can't afford to see this get lost in the mix. I just think it's too important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, as I said, I hope this is the first conversation of many to come. I know that Morgan, she'll talk about this in a second, has a lot planned uh, for the months, weeks, ahead. We certainly do. I certainly do. We're using my office to keep this issue at the forefront in particular. So thank you. And Morgan, concluding words from you. Yeah, I, th I think you touched on it earlier. I think we need to no longer accept that this doesn't exist within our society, right? We need we need this infrastructure, and, and we've been we've been saying for when when they develop the two different infrastructure plans, you know, we we we've been saying loud and clear, care is infrastructure, um, and we need that we need that. Uh, within our society. Um, and thank you for lifting up, you know, the way in which we are gonna lift up our voices throughout the summer. So please, number one, please connect with us on our sign on. This will be an organizing tool, a way for us to connect with you um, and, and um, find ways for us to uh, do targeted actions, maybe come together in another virtual Zoom, maybe later in the summer, we'll do an event um, in person, socially distance and, um, and safe where we can all be together so more people can share their stories. Um, again, we know that our federal delegation has uh, supports this issue um, and we just wanna continue to show our resounding yes on this and also just to raise public consciousness, uh, consciousness consciousness nationally so that we can get it across the finish line. So we will be sure to stay in touch with you all on this um, so that we can do this together. Thank you, Morgan. And this concludes our last seat at the table for this legislative session. Um, it's been a interesting, I'll just share personally, it's been a really interesting uh, first few months in office and it's been challenging not to see people and actually have a physical seat at the table in the office. So I hope we can do that uh, starting next January and have folks back. But I just wanna thank again, all of our panelists today, everyone who's tuning in and has been tuning in um, throughout the spring. Um, I just greatly appreciate the opportunity to be able to uplift um, the stories of all of you, of Vermonters. And that's what my office is about and will continue to be about um, as we work to recover stronger and build a really bright future for our state. So thank you. And, and uh, this will be available on YouTube. Please um, share with colleagues and friends and let's keep the momentum going. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks so much.